Good. All right, well, uh, <clears throat> we're uh, continuing our walk through the Ordo Salutis. Let me pray, and then we'll get started, okay? Father in heaven, thank you for your word, and Lord, we want to be submissive to it. Lord, we don't want uh, our hearts to be Lord, rebellious against it, and we also want, uh, Lord, to listen to you only. Lord, we don't want to hear, uh, hear people's opinions, or we want to hear your word. And so I pray that as we study this morning, as we consider this idea of regeneration and the effectual call, but I pray that you would uh, give our hearts uh, eyes to see, or that we would see these things from your word, and or that we would behold the glory that is in this truth, Lord, that we've been born again, Lord. What a stunning thing. And I pray that that would fill our hearts with joy and peace as we believe it, Lord. We trust that you do this work in us, and so, Lord, we pray these things, uh, trusting that you will work in us uh, through your word. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, well, um, these topics, uh, as you know, uh, I think you probably all at some point or other studied these or at least like looked into them in some depth. So uh, in some ways it is a review. Uh, we, we are reviewing. Uh, so I, I, I get that. But the goal of all this, obviously, is just to help us have scriptural support for these things so that when topics come up and in conversation or discussion, you know the verses to turn to and places to go. So hopefully that's the goal and it's helpful for you. Uh, but we'll... This is the third part of the Order Salutis, the Order of Salvation. Uh, this is on the effectual call and regeneration. Okay, so we're going to break this apart uh, as best we can. Um, God's act. So we, we, last week we talked about predestination, foreknowledge, and election. We talked about how God elects those who are saved, and He does that by a predetermined or a predestined plan, and that that is something that uh, includes a foreknowledge, which is a prior affection for His people. He loves His people from before the foundation of the world, and because of that, He predestines them for salvation and in that there is an election a choice that he has carried out in their salvation so picked all those apart the way that that happens in space and time is through the effectual call um, the, uh, the call of God is an open offer of salvation in the proclamation of God's mercy so there's this proclamation of God's mercy it's a wide open offer of the gospel to anyone who's under the hearing of the gospel uh, God has a willingness in his heart to redeem sinners but the proclamation of it but by this uh, proclamation of the gospel, the external call, God works through the Spirit to regenerate the hearts of those whom he has chosen. So through the proclamation of the gospel, regeneration happens. Regeneration is a fruit, actually, of the gospel itself, the proclaimed gospel. Okay? So that's what we're going to pick apart today, uh, piece by piece. Obviously, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any time. Happy to, happy to have questions. Okay? All right. So here we go. The first one is just the gospel, or what we would call the external call. Okay? The external call. Why do we call it the external call? Well, it's something that happens outside of us, or we can call it the gospel call. There's a proclamation of the gospel. We just preach the gospel, right? That's really all this is talking about. So the gospel call is the external proclamation of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Three vital components to a true external call, okay? The first one is that the gospel must include the specific facts about the life, death, <coughs> burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the purpose of the salvation of his people. First Corinthians uh, 15, 3, and 4, right? Paul says, I preach to you now the gospel which I proclaim to you. And he says, the gospel is that Christ died according uh, uh, on the third day, uh, died according to the scriptures, right? Was, ra was buried and was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures for our sins. So those components all have to be in there for the gospel to be truly preached, okay? Without those specific components, this is important, the gospel has not been shared with clarity. We can say we shared the gospel with somebody, but if you haven't talked about the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ for the sins of his people, you haven't actually shared the gospel, okay? Those things have to be in the proclamation of the gospel. So that's the first piece that has to be, which should make sense, right? Second piece that has to be there is that the gospel must include a specific and earnest statement by the sharer regarding the requirement of the hearer to repent and believe, okay? This is the offer of salvation. For, to preach the gospel, you can explain all the facts of the gospel and never say, if you believe this, you'll be saved. Without that, like, offer of salvation, you haven't actually proclaimed the gospel. Do you guys need notes? Anyone else need notes? I think there's more in the back. Okay, good. Okay, so... That's the, that's the gospel offer, right? That's the gospel proclamation. So you have the proclamation of the facts, and then you have the offer of those facts for the sins of the person who is hearing the proclamation of the gospel. So again, without that, we, haven't, we can't say that we've actually shared the gospel. And the third is that the gospel call must include a statement of God's promise to forgive sins, okay? This promise is included in Christ's offer. Remember John 3, 16? It includes this promise. Whoever believes in him will not perish. That's a promise, right? So 
All three of those components have to be included if you're going to truly proclaim the gospel to someone. To truly preach the gospel includes all three of those. Statement of facts, statement of what must be done in response to the facts, and then statement of God's response to what is done in the, on the basis of that gospel truth. Okay? Does that make sense? Sometimes you hear, you know, we, we, we preach the gospel with our smile. Maybe you've heard that before. You don't. You might be a really nice person. That's good. You might, off, might open a door for you to talk to someone about the gospel, but that's not a proclamation of the gospel. Okay? The proclamation of the gospel includes those three components. Okay? Good? Good. Okay, so a helpful summary of the gospel. <clears throat> there are lots of these. You can, have any, you can use any one you like. This one's helpful for me. I like it because I'm a very simple person. So <laughs> it's just one letter. You, know, you just have to just remember one letter, and that letter is S. Okay? These are the four S's of the gospel. If you're sharing the gospel with someone, I think it's helpful to remember these. Even if you don't say them out loud, it's helpful to keep them in your head. I think it's actually helpful to say when you're sharing the gospel. So the first one is sovereign, right? God is sovereign over all things, and he is therefore the, the righteous judge of the earth. Okay, so God created the universe, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, Jesus is the judge of the world. He has the right to judge the world in righteousness, and he will judge the world in righteousness. So you have God who is sovereign, who has the right to judge sinners, and who will someday judge sinners according to his righteous standard. Okay, so that's the sovereign. Okay, bad news, point two, sinner. Okay, man has sinned and fallen short of God's glory and is therefore rightfully under the wrath of God. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, right? So God's wrath is revealed against unrighteousness, and he will judge every single sin that's ever been committed on the, on the earth in the history of the world. Every sin will be judged completely fairly, okay? So sharing the gospel, we're going to include that reality of sin and what God has done and what God will do in the judgment of sinners, Okay? Third one, obviously, is the Savior. Jesus Christ came into the world, suffered, died, was buried, and raised from the dead to save sinners from the wrath of God because of God's love for humanity. Okay, 1 Timothy 1.15 it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Right, So that reality is true. <clears throat> so we have those texts. And then last is the summons, right? God is calling all men everywhere to repent and believe the reality of this free gift of salvation. Isaiah 45, 22, come into me all the ends of the earth and be saved, right? Paul, Acts 17, he says the same thing. God is calling all men everywhere to repent. So those realities are the call of God, the invitation of God is offered to the world, okay? Make sense? If you want to get these into your head, memorize those verses. It's super helpful. It's a, it's a helpful way to walk someone through the gospel and explain it to them. And even if, you don't, even if you don't say, as the Bible says in Acts 17, 30 and 31, you don't have to say it that way, but if you're communicating that truth to someone, it's very helpful to be able to just quote the verse, even if you don't put the, the chapter in reference. To quote the scripture is uh, to give them the exact words of God on these issues. So it's helpful. Okay? Good? Okay, so it's a helpful way to share the gospel. Get some of those uh, details in your in your head, and then it helps you when those situations arise, right? You get stuck on an elevator with someone, and you have one minute to share the gospel, and they say, Nathan, what must I do to be saved? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm going to tease you. <laughs> There's four Ps. Oh, yeah, it's S's. <laughs> right? So those are good. It's good to have those in your head so you're able to just pop those up. Well, actually, let me explain it to you. God is sovereign, right? He created the universe, and he's a righteous judge, and he will someday judge your sins. And I know you're a sinner because everyone who's ever been born is a sinner, and yet God sent his son of the world to die on the cross for your sins. If you trust and repent, God will forgive you for all your sins and accept you into his family and adoption. You can do that right now. Right, then the gospel's done. Okay, good. Okay, so the external call, this is point A. The external call is the outward proclamation of this gospel call and is done through the verbal proclamation of these truths. While this is important, the external call does not result in anyone's regeneration. Just preaching the gospel doesn't result in anyone's regeneration. Much as we wish it would. I mean, how many times have you shared the gospel with someone and you prayed and said, Lord, please change them from the inside and nothing happens. It's like, Sparks of the North Sea, like we were saying in prayer this morning. There's nothing you can do. It doesn't do anything, right? Well, that's because that's the external call, but it's not effectuated by the Spirit of God in the internal call, which is what we'll get to, okay? So, <clears throat> some specifics on the external call. Number one, turn to Romans 10. We're going to walk through this passage. We actually walked through this together a few months ago, but we just want to look at these texts. <clears throat> 
So there is a verbal proclamation. There is a necessity for the hearing of the gospel. That doesn't mean you can't have that through scripture. A person can be saved absolutely just by reading the Bible, of course. But that, in, the, in one sense, that is a verbal proclamation, right? It's language being communicated to the human soul. So there is this proclamation uh, which is necessary. If you look at verse 13 of Romans chapter 10, it says, Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So you have this promise of God. You call on the name of God, you will be saved. Paul says, How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? So the necessity actually in, in that reality is that there must be someone to proclaim that word to them. Okay? Someone must proclaim that word to them. In other words, they can't repent they can't hear apart from the hearing of the of the truths of the gospel right that's why the church sends out missionaries pastors preachers all those things why do we do that well we're sending them to proclaim the gospel because how will they hear unless they are told right so they have to hear that gospel message okay uh, in the context not all who hear the good news right not all who hear heed the good news look at verse 16 it says, however, they did not all heed the good news. That word in Greek is hupakuo. It means to hear and obey, right? To listen, not just to hear and say, oh yeah, I have the, data, the facts, but to submit yourself to the thing that's been heard. And Paul says, not all who hear, heed. They don't all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report, right? So the reality is there is, there is many, there are many who don't, who hear, but then who don't submit to that truth, Okay. Okay, so the gospel has to be heard. However, of course, there is the blindness of the human soul. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. You should be familiar with this text by now. <laughs> we go to this one a lot. It's important, 4.4-6. Four, four to six. We're going to come back to this again and again and again. But that apart from the work of God, everyone who's ever been born is blind to the glories of the gospel, Right? Unbelievers reject God. They reject the call of God, and they choose sin rather than Christ. They choose sin rather than repentance, right? In uh, verse 4, it says, In whose case the God of this world... Who's the God of this world? Satan. Satan, right? The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. That's a fascinating bunch of language, right? Where's he? What's he talking about? He's talking about our minds, right? Our thinking. Our thinking is blinded, he says. And what's, bl what's blinded of the eyes of our minds... What it is is unbelief, right? So in unbelief, the, our minds are blinded to the truth of the gospel. The gospel call we, is received, that external call. The mind is blinded because there's no belief in the gospel. And the one who's actually, the, the one who's carrying that out, Paul says, is Satan. Satan is the one who does that, okay? So that's what an unbeliever has happened inside of them, right? Remember in the parable of the soils, what's the first soil in the parable of the soils? Yeah, good, yeah. The, the birds come, snatch the seed up, and it doesn't grow at all, right? That's, and, and Jesus says, Satan comes and picks the seed up, right? That's literally what's happening, okay? So there's an act in which there, there is something that Satan is doing to blind the minds of the unbelieving, to keep them from believing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, okay? And that is not just Satan. It's not like they're unwilling, you know, that they want to believe, but Satan blinds them. It's not that. Their hearts are also hard. Their hearts are blinded and darkened. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. So they're hard-hearted. Their hearts are blinded. They don't want to hear. And there's this external call, and Satan essentially cooperates with their evil nature in taking the seed away so that they don't hear the gospel and repent and believe. Okay? So in this sense, the gospel call is powerless on their hearts apart from the power of the Spirit in the work of regeneration. If the Spirit doesn't do something, nothing's going to happen, right? Uh, which, is, <laughs> which, which is hard when you're sharing the gospel with someone, right? Because you're saying something and you realize you're, you're, you're asking them to do something that is entirely apart from what they're able to do. You're asking them to perform a miracle themselves, and they can't. They can't do it, right? So it is a totally impossible thing that you're asking them to do, which is why we need the Spirit of God. Third, uh, some aspects of the external call, okay? First one is that it's universal. The external call is a universal call in the sense that it is to be proclaimed to all people everywhere, right? The gospel is to be preached to all the nations without distinction. The Great Commission, go therefore into what? All the nations, there's everybody, right? Go to everybody. There's no distinction, there's no separation, no distinction in humanity. All humanity needs to hear the gospel. And Paul himself says that God is calling all men everywhere. 
that doesn't, that, there's no exclusions there, right? All men everywhere to repent. You can go anywhere in the world and preach the gospel, and your call to everyone everywhere is that they repent, okay? For everybody, right? So the first aspect is that it is a universal call. Second, it is a call made in good faith. What does that mean? Well, we talked last week about the predestining, electing work of God. So if you know that God is predestining people, when you preach the gospel to them, is that really a good faith offer? Like, you can think of that in, in real estate terms, right? If I say, I can sell you my house, right? That's a good faith offer. But if I say I can sell my house to someone who has no money, is that truly a good faith offer? That's the question, right? The answer is yes, it is made in good faith, right? It is a good faith offer of the gospel. Why? Well, in a very real sense, anyone who repents and believes, calling on the name of the Lord for salvation, will be saved. Anyone who repents, calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. That's absolutely true, right? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We looked at this text uh, in, the, in the conversation about predestination. Verse 3, he says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So he's telling us to pray for everyone. He says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants, literally, everyone to be saved. That's his revealed will. God's desire is that everyone be saved. That's why he says, come unto me all the ends of the earth and be saved. In God's revealed will, his desire is that everyone would be saved. Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. In other words, what? There's one way to heaven, right? And when we proclaim the gospel, that offer of that one way to heaven is an open-ended offer to every single person to repent and believe, okay? So it is made in good faith, right? Now, some people argue that there must be a real possibility of the call being accepted in order for it to be said to be made in, God, in good faith, right? In other words, if they can't accept it, then is it really a good faith offer? And the answer is yes, it still remains a good faith offer. It's still an offer saying, listen, you can do this. Come to me and be saved. Now, the heart of the person isn't going to move that direction apart from the work of God. However, it's still an offer that is a true offer. And we see this actually in other places in Scripture. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is a, an, an interesting parallel. In Deuteronomy, you have the last words of Moses. He's essentially, it's essentially one giant sermon he's preaching, right? In Deuteronomy 30, we have some of his very last words. Verse 15, look what he says in verse 15 in chapter 30. He says, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. In that I, I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live and your descendants. Right? What does he say? Choose life. Okay? Was that a good faith offer of choice of life for the nation of Israel? Yes. Could they choose life? They could have. Were they going to? Strong no. <laughs> and Moses actually says exactly that. Right? He says exactly that. He says, you will not choose this, right? It's, a, it's really interesting. He tells them, you're not going to do this. I know you're not going to do this. And when you don't do it, I will. God will cast you out of the land that I'm going to bring you to. Okay? All right, good. Okay, so we have that. So God's heart for all unbelievers is that they turn from their sin and live. Uh, other texts that are important, look real quickly at Ezekiel chapter 18. just want to give you these verses so you see them. Ezekiel chapter 18. Starting in verse 21. It's more or less right in the middle. Open your Bible right to the middle and turn right. Just a little bit. Okay. Uh, Ezekiel 18, 21, he says, But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he will shall surely live, he shall not die. All of his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him because, it, because of his righteousness which he has practiced. He will live 
this verse, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? God says, I don't, I don't want to send people to hell, right? When he expresses his name in Exodus, what does he say? The Lord, the Lord God, he doesn't say judgmental and harsh, right? No, he says compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and yet does not leave the wicked unpunished. That's the last thing in the list of the name of God. He, he must because he's a righteous judge, but his heart is that we would turn and live. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions on that one? You remember Peter's proclamation of the gospel in the Acts 2, right? You have the sermon, Peter's first sermon. And he preaches to them and he says, and they say, they're, he says they're pricked in their hearts and they say, what must we do? And he says, you should repent and be baptized, right? For the forgiveness of your sins. What's he saying? He's saying, turn right now, turn to God. Did the nation of Israel turn to God? No, of course not. But that offer was a true good faith offer to the nation of Israel. Okay? Any questions on that one? Okay, good. So helpful. Either you're sleeping, or it's something you've already heard. <laughs> Chris is drooling on his shirt in the back row. Okay, good. Okay, and the third aspect of the uh, universal call, or the external call, is that it's not efficacious in itself. The external call is the true word of God Almighty, but it is only made effective through the power of the Spirit. This is important. There was a guy named, there's a guy named Carl Bart, who you should not read. Uh, he's a terrible guy. <laughs> But he said that the word only had power when it was actuated in the heart of the person. Outside of that, it wasn't the true word of God. And then it became the word of God when it was actuated inside the heart of the person by the spirit of God. That's why you don't read Carl Bart. <laughs> He's a bad guy. That is, that's heresy, actually. Okay? The word of God is the word of God. It carries power all the time. right? It has the power to convert everybody. The question is, does it then get worked out in the, by the spirit in the heart of the person? Okay? It's always the word of God. It's always absolutely true, but it isn't efficacious in itself, right? It does not change the truth of the gospel call, nor does it mean that the gospel is not the power of God unto salvation without the assent of the hearer, but simply that the gospel's power is actuated in the hearts of those whom God chooses to save, right? The gospel is always powerful. The question is, is it plugged into the heart? That's the question. If it's not plugged into the heart, it's not carrying out what it is that God has designed it to do. So the spirit is the one who puts the plug in the wall so that the gospel then comes with power and moves inside the heart of the person. Okay? Does that make sense? Erase Carl Bart's name from your mind. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's a bad guy. Anyway, he's not the worst guy, but he's pretty bad. Okay, so that's the external call. Okay, so we have this external call. We have the proclamation of the gospel. What's our responsibility as Christians? We take seed, and what do we do with the seed? We just throw it. You just throw it everywhere, right? We have outreach meeting today. After church, join us for outreach meeting, right? It's such a good opportunity to gather together as a team and take the seed of the word of God and pass it out to people, right? And you can do that on your own, you know, privately. You can do that through venues that the church provides. But our heart should be, I know this truth. We have this treasure hidden, hidden in earthen vessels, right? And I'm going to take this and I'm going to tell people about it because it's the best thing in the world and you need to know it, right? That's the, that's the reality, okay? So that's the external call. But what happens in the heart of a person who's truly saved? And this is point two, the effectual call. The effectual call. Grudem defines <clears throat> effectual calling as an act of God the Father speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel in which he summons people to himself in such a way that they respond in saving faith. That's helpful, right? This external call, God uses that external call in such a way that it summons the person to God, right? God commands them to come. And he uses that word summons because it is a call. It's an actual calling that the person receives in such a way that they are then moved toward God, okay? Uh, Sproul defines it as a call of God by his sovereign power and authority, which brings about his designed and ordained effect or result. Okay? So God calls and something happens. Okay, well, what does it mean? Well, this is point A there in the meaning. The Bible affirms that there is a call of God which effectually calls men to salvation, a call limited to the elect, right? Romans 8.30, those whom he predestined, he also what? Called, right? So that calling in Romans 8.30 in the Ordo Salutis is the effectual call of God. He has predestined us, and therefore that call is effected by God in such a way that we are then born again unto salvation. Okay? All right, so the verb kaleo means to author authoritatively communi communicate a demand for the presence or participation of. In other words, when you call someone, if you're Caesar and you call someone, they don't say no, right? They say yes. Why? Because you're Caesar. And that's the same idea that's being put into play when, God, when Paul uses that term. Okay? 
Just as the universe came into being through the summons of God, so two sinners are called to salvation by God's calling or summons, right? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This idea of calling is compared to creation. <laughs> In the same way that God calls sinners <clears throat> to himself, he calls creation into existence. Chapter 4, verse 6, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness. When did he do that? At creation, right? God said, let there be light. There's no, there's no light. God says, let there be light. What happens the next very, the very next moment? Light is everywhere, right? So God says light, and there is light, right? In the same way, God does the same thing in the heart of a believer. It says, for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So the shining of Christ happens in the heart, and that happens because of God's sovereign working in the same way that he called creation into being. It's simply a statement which then affects a, a reaction or a response in the heart of the person. Okay? Good. <clears throat> so, just as Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb and Lazarus obeyed Jesus' summons, sinners who receive God's effectual call by his irresistible grace cannot reject it but must respond to his call. Okay? And, it call, and effectual calling falls under the category of God's sovereign or decorative will. Okay, so we have God's revealed will that everyone come to him and be saved. And so we have this universal open gospel call. But those who are actually effectually called by God are under his sovereign or decorative will. In other words, we proclaim the gospel to a crowd of 100 people. One guy comes forward and says, what you just said is true. Why did he come forward? It's not because he's better than the 99 or he's got more, he's like more mentally aware or anything like that. It's because God chose him from the foundation of the world and then affected that reality in the proclamation of the gospel. Okay? You've heard the joke, right, about Spurgeon? I'm sure you've heard this story. Someone came to him and said, why do you preach to everyone? You always preach the gospel. You should just preach to the elect. And what did Spurgeon say? Do you remember this? No? Spurgeon said, if the Lord were so kind as to paint a yellow stripe down the back of every elect person, I would stop preaching the gospel and I would just go around London pulling shirts out of pants. <laughs> but he said, since he hasn't done that, I preach to everyone and the ones whom he's chosen will come to him. Okay? So that that reality is the, the external call. Okay? Okay, so the means. All God the Father calls the elect. That's terrible grammar. God the Father calls the elect through the agency of the Holy Spirit into fellowship with his Son. Right? The Spirit does this work in the heart. The Spirit makes us alive so that we can then worship God. And God uses the gospel of Jesus Christ, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, to call sinners to himself. How do sinners get saved? How do they come to God? Well, it's through the gospel itself, right? The gospel itself has the power to save. And we're going to come to that. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Okay? In God's sovereign plan, he has vested the gospel with his power to cause the calling of sinners to himself. Look at James chapter 1, verse 18. James chapter 1, verse 18. Super important verse because it combines the first two steps of the Ordo Salutis. <clears throat> verse 18, it says, In the exercise of his will. Okay, so here you have God exercising his will, right? What did he do? He brought us forth. He birthed us, right? So God exercised his will for us to be birthed, right? Which we're going to cover in just a minute in regeneration. And that occurred how he says by the word of truth that is the gospel right god used the gospel to birth us into salvation and that was an exercise of his will he chose to do it he exercised his will we were born again we were saved through the power of the gospel okay first peter chapter 1 verse 23 exactly the same idea is communicated there okay and paul and paul calls the gospel the power of god unto salvation right romans 1, 16, and 17. It is the power of God in the salvation. Why, do, why does he say that? Well, because it is literally the power of God in the salvation, because in the preaching of the gospel, God calls the sinner to himself, okay? And that connection between the gospel and Christ is made explicit in 1 Corinthians 1. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is really interesting. This idea of the power of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> 
verse 18, he says, For the word of the cross, is the word of the cross, the gospel, is foolishness to those who are perishing. So that's the external call, right? You preach the gospel, those who are perishing, to them, they hear it, they're like, oh, that's dumb, and they reject it, right? And he says, but to those who, but to us who are being saved, pa passive voice, right? It is the power of God. So the gospel is the power of God. Okay, that's, that's, he ties those two things together. So he says the proclamation of the gospel, the unbelieving, they hear it, it's foolishness to them. Those who are being saved, those who are receiving salvation by God, to them, it is the power of God. Okay? And then you have this description. We have the, the story of the Jew, the Gentile, the Jews, uh, we're down in verse 22. Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, and to, Christ, and to Gentiles foolishness. We preach Christ crucified. That's the gospel, right? But look what it says. But to those who are the called... Both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God. Okay? Isn't that interesting? Christ the power of God. In, in verse 18, what's the power of God? The gospel is the power of God. And in verse 24, what's the power of God? Christ is the power of God. Okay, so what's he doing? Paul's taking the gospel and Christ and he's putting them together. The statements of the gospel are the revelation of Jesus Christ personally. Does that make sense? Exactly the same language you use in 2 Corinthians 4 4, where he says, that, that you, they, they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Light, gospel, glory, God. Gospel and Christ are united together, okay? Great book. If you haven't read it, God is the Gospel by John Piper. Grab that, read it. Fantastic book. It's amazing. One of the best books ever. Top ten. That I've read. <laughs> Which is actually not, not saying that much. Okay. okay, so that reality of the gospel being the power of Christ specifically is, is so important, right? In that sense, when we preach Christ, when we preach the gospel, what are we actually doing? We're proclaiming the power of God, right? If Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, God is making an appeal through us, right? He's actually, Paul is like, hey, I'm, a, I'm just a pipe, right? God is appealing through me. It's not me, I'm just using He's using me as a vessel to make the proclamation that he himself is making. Anytime you share the gospel with anybody, anybody, what is God doing in that moment? He is speaking through you. That's an amazing truth. You're just a pipe. God is talking through you, and the power of God is coming out of your mouth in the person of Jesus Christ as you proclaim the death of Christ for sinners. Okay? Which is fantastic. I mean, if you're like, I don't like to share the gospel. What? You're using the power of God. It's coming through you. You're just a pipe, right? That's amazing. God is speaking through you when you do that. So uh, rejoice as you share the gospel. Okay? Any questions on that part? We have outreach meeting after church today. It's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> just keep plugging that. Okay. Point C, the relationship of effectual calling to human choice. This is where it gets a little more sticky as it were right how does the effectual call relate to human choice well this is interesting right the relationship of the effectual call to human will is not unilaterally deterministic but it is to be understood in terms of concurrence which is the simultaneity of first and second causes i'm sorry i know i apologize <laughs> we use language like that just to be clear but let me explain what that means right <laughs> It's not unilaterally, God isn't just like, I grabbed Ben by the collar and jerked him into this, right? And Ben's like, what, what? Oh, I'm supposed to believe, okay, right? No, that's not what happens. What happens? Those two things happen in concurrence, right? God, this is simultaneous events, right? God calls, someone else believes. There's concurrence in those two things at the same time, okay? It's not unilaterally deterministic. In other words, God doesn't just unilaterally do something in the call, okay? In his unilateral working, the person who believes, Ben in this case, believes at the same time. Those things happen in simultaneity, okay? Does that make sense? Simultaneous events, God first cause, Ben second cause, but simultaneous events. Yes, Mike? What is causing Ben to believe? God, yeah. God is first cause, Ben is second cause. So causality is important. First cause means the one who actually affects this to take place. In that sense, Ben's response is, I mean, Ben's faith is a response to God's first cause. And yet Ben is believing at that moment. And so Ben is simultaneously responding to that reality. It's not completely unilateral or monergistic. In that sense, in the sense of Ben's faith. Yes, Chris? It is, 
It is what? It is deterministic. It's not unilaterally deterministic. Yes. Yes, Kathy. In the text that says God draws us near, that phrase draws us near, is there like a period of time where the person may be drawn near and then you have that effectual call? Yeah. Yeah, so the spirit can the spirit can over the over the course of time draw someone I mean God draws people to himself, right? It sometimes that's a cold turkey, I've never heard this before. I hear it like Lydia, right? The seller of purple. Paul goes, preaches the gospel, she gets saved like instantaneously, right? Or you have someone who's like the Philippian jailer I mean not the Philippian jailer, the um, Ethiopian eunuch who is a Jew, he's been up at the temple, he's reading Isaiah, he's not a believer, but God is working through those things and Philip shows up on the side of the road and he's like, can someone help me understand Isaiah 53? I mean, talk about like, like tee ball with the gospel, right? Can someone help me with Isaiah 53? <laughs> Set the ball on the tee. Philip hits the ball. He gets saved. He wasn't saved prior to that, but obviously the spirit was working through the word to effectuate that event. Yeah. So everyone's timing and that's drawing when the person's, when that person's drawing to Christ or yeah. Christ, everyone's is different, right? Totally. It could be yeah. years, it could be totally. instant, it could be... Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the means that God uses to do that is different in every single case. But the moment of salvation is always the same. God effectuates the calling of the gospel in one event. I mean, how many of you were raised in Christian homes, you heard the gospel a thousand times before you got saved? I heard the gospel a thousand times. And never, for, for me, it was always just like, boom, 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 you know, bouncing off me. And then one day the Lord was like... No. <laughs> and I heard it, and I really heard it, right? And I believed it was all in one simultaneous event. Okay? Good? Yes? So if you, would, if you wouldn't call it um, unilaterally deterministic, how, how, do you, how do you talk about the fact that the first is always, the first action of God is always effectual? Yeah, so the effectual actor in that case is the first actor, right? Right. So in terms of first and second causality, the first actor is always the effectual actor, always. Right. So in this case, I would say it is deterministic in the sense that God effectuates that, but it's not unilaterally deterministic. The secondary cause is actually simultaneously working with the first cause. The That's, first cause is... is the effectual determining cause, but the it's second... Like unilateral. He's, yeah, yeah, so he's working unilaterally right. in, that effectuate, in that effectuation of the cause. Right. But the simultaneous response of the second cause makes it not a unilaterally deterministic event. In other words, God isn't violating the human will to do that. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to that in regeneration, because that's actually, like, that idea, like, does that violate the human will? And I would say no, right. because it's not unilaterally deterministic. Yeah. Okay, so although it is true that effective that effe effective calling awakens and brings forth the response from us, we must always insist that this response still has to be a voluntary, willing response in which the individual person puts his or her faith and trust in Christ. Okay? There's a voluntary receiving and believing of the gospel in the heart of the person. We can't say God just violated the human will and bam, you were saved. Sorry, you didn't want to be saved, but God did that. No, God, we, I mean, sometimes we have experience like that, right? But that's not what happens. We are choosing to believe in God and to trust him and to put our faith in him. Now, God is the first cause of that and we respond to him. We're going to get to that in regeneration in just a second, okay? So... If you have all sorts of philosophical questions, just pause. We'll talk about regeneration, and then you can fight me. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so the response to the effectual calling, okay? These are, there's, a, there's a chart here which got pushed to the second page, which makes it very confusing and hard to follow. But uh, let me show you what it is. Views, okay? <clears throat> Pelagianism. There's a guy named Pelagius. He was a British monk. The British, always bad, right? Pelagius. They believe this. Man accepts God of his own free will without the necessity of grace. In other words, I came by myself and chose God. He did not help me choose him. True Pelagianism believes that. God didn't help me in any way. I just came to him. Came to him. I chose to do it. Okay? Then there's a modified Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism, which is Roman Catholicism. By, by availing himself as a, of a modicum of divine grace, man can accept God's call. I started to come. God helped me to do it. Okay? That's Roman Catholicism. Okay? Third view is Arminianism. By means of a universal helping grace or other provenient grace, God coaxes man by giving him the possibility of a free choice. 
Okay, so you see this is like another like iteration of that. So Pelagianism is, I did it all, God did nothing, the gospel is still true. Second one would be a semi-Pelagian view, which is I started, and as I was walking, God just helped me get to the finish line. Okay? Now we have this Arminianism, which is God started it by his universal provenient grace, and then I engaged with that provenient grace, and now it carries me forward. Right? Sort of like the Incredit Coaster. Right? When you're in the Incredit Coaster, you're sitting there in Disneyland, all of a sudden the, the, the engine engages and you shoot off in the roller coaster. Right? That's the same idea that's sort of being communicated there. Okay? And the, the last one is Calvinism, which we use the term Calvinism loosely because Calvinism, Calvin has lots of things we don't agree with, but a Calvinistic view, Calvin essentially came up with this view, uh, after, I mean, obviously Augustine, before him. Man comes to Christ by the effective, effectual working of God's grace. God irresistibly brought me to Christ. Okay? So those are the four possible views. I work by myself, God works, and then I respond. Those are the two poles, Right? And in between, you have, I did most of the work, God helped me on the way, that's Roman Catholicism. God started the work in the general call, and then I just responded to that, which is Arminianism. Okay? So far, so good? Those are the four possible views of the calling. Okay, so here we go, regeneration. We have 15 minutes. We're going to go, <laughs> we're going to... Kind of bust through this a little quicker. Okay, the term regeneration appears only twice in the New Testament, Titus 3.5 and Matthew 19.28. In Titus 3.5, Paul uses the term to describe salvation. Matthew 19.28, Jesus uses the term to describe the restoration of all things at the coming of Christ in glory, his second coming. Okay, so there's only two times that this term specifically is used. Right? The Greek term is a compound word. It derives from pollen and genesis, uh, which means new genesis, either in the sense of a return to existence or coming back from life to death or renewal to a higher existence. There's this new birth, right? That's what's being described, a new life that then is given, okay? The term is closely connected. Even though it's used only twice, it's closely connected to Christ's language in John 3, 3 and 7, where Jesus tells Nicodemus that he must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. You guys remember that language, right? Nicodemus shows up. He's like, well, we know... What must I do? What does Jesus say? You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? That's insanity. You can't go back into your mother's womb. So he understands what, what Jesus is saying in that statement, right? New birth must happen. Okay, so that's the regeneration. Okay, so we're going to work toward a definition. Okay, so this is point A. On the basis of the impossibility of the contrary. What does that mean? It means man's natural state is one of spiritual blindness and unbelief. Things of the Spirit of God are foolishness to the dead hearts of unbelievers, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The things of the Spirit of God are foolishness to unbelievers. They just can't possibly understand them, right? They're dead. They're dead in their trespasses and sins, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, so they will not receive the external call of God of their own volition. They cannot receive the external call of their own volition. No one ever has ever been saved because they were wise enough to have faith and to embrace the gospel. That cannot happen. Why do we know that? Because Paul says it can't happen. The things of the Spirit of God are foolishness to the natural man. He will not hear the gospel. Okay? God has to work. Okay. Which provides the basis for a simple definition. Regeneration is a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to his elect. Uh, which is sort of from Grudem, and so I, I quoted him, but that's not completely Grudem's definition, right? Regeneration, new birth, is a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to his elect, okay? So we're going to take those pieces apart. No, point B there, God as author. What does God do in regeneration? Well, it is through the Spirit of God. Jesus himself states that the new birth is a work of the Spirit, right? Paul affirms this reality in Titus 3.5. We're not going to turn there for the sake of time, but in Titus 3.5, he says you've been regenerated by the Spirit. You are born again by the Spirit of God. Jesus' comparison with wind is instructive. Remember John 3, 8? What does he say? The wind blows where it wishes. No one knows where it goes or where it comes from. So is the Spirit of God, right? In other words, what? God is free. The wind is not something that humanity controls. Instead, the wind moves with arbitrary freedom, affects what it wills. This is the same work of the, this is the same as in the work of the Spirit in the hearts of those whom he has regenerated, okay? The Spirit of God just regenerates people. We have no idea why. No one would have guessed that Paul would be saved, right? Ever. If all the people in all of ancient Greece and Israel, you would have said Paul's the very last guy that should be saved. And the Spirit of God blows, Paul gets saved, right? So don't ever give up hope on anybody. Sometimes we think that people are hopeless and they're not, okay? And second, this is apart from man's will. John affirms that this new birth is entirely apart from the will of man or of any activity of human flesh. John 1.13, right? Uh, 
It's not of the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, but the will of God, right? To them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. No moral afterthought process can produce new birth in the sinner. It must be a work of God alone, okay? No moral act will produce new birth in you. You cannot earn your regeneration. Nothing you do can ever bring that to you in that sense, okay? So, third, it is the basis for all spiritual life. Ezekiel 20, 36, 25 through 27. Let's turn to this one really quick. This one's so important. Ezekiel 36. We have this description of the new covenant. And what will happen in the new covenant. God is speaking. It's said to Israel, verse 24, he says, I will take you from the nations, gather you from the lands, and bring you into your own land. Verse 25, then I will sp sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols, right? He will purify them. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to obey or to observe my ordinances, okay? What's he saying? New heart, spiritual, uh, spiritually alive heart, who does that? Every single statement in there is an act of God. I will give you this. I will give you a new heart. I will take your old heart, out, or old heart out. I will give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Every piece of that is God's sovereign, free action into the heart of the person, okay? He's acting. Okay, so God is the author of regeneration. Okay? All subsequent obedience is the downstream effect of this regenerating work. God regenerates, and then everything that comes out of that is the response of man to God. Okay, point C, it's nature. It's nature, the nature of regeneration. Number one, it is the impartation of the life of God. Okay, regeneration is a movement of God in the sinner in such a way that the very life of God himself now dwells in the heart of the regenerate. Paul describes this reality in Ephesians 2.5. Having been dead, God made us alive together with Christ, right? Ephesians 2.5. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, if, you, if he stopped the letter there, it would have been terrible, right? Ephesians 2.4. But God made us alive together with Christ. That's what he did. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loves us. This new life is said to be the very life of God himself, so much so that we are now in Christ and Christ is in us. What does Paul say? Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but what? Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Paul says, Christ is in me, and I am in Christ. That reality is constantly true in such a way that we are completely, we have completely received the imparted life of God. Colossians 1.29, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, right? Consider yourselves what? Dead to sin, but what? Alive to God in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. Both of those realities are true in such a way that you are said to be united to him, okay? Second, it is a holistic recreation. It recreates the whole person, the whole nature of the person. It is as comprehensive as our depravity, right? Paul says that we are new creations in Christ. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have been made new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Just as we are totally depraved, now we have been entirely made new in our nature, right? We have this new nature in Christ. The mind, heart, and will of man are completely changed. There's a helpful quote from Sinclair Ferguson down below, okay? And the fruit of this new birth is extensive. What does that mean? It means it has extended fruit that comes out of this new birth. In fact, the entire Christian life flows out of this new life that is now imparted by God to us. And there's a few of those. There's a love for righteousness, John 3, 21. There's a hate for sin, uh, Matthew 5, 4, and Romans 6, 2. There's a desire for God's presence. You want to be with God, right? Psalm 27, one thing I've asked the Lord, and that I will seek after, that I might dwell in the, in, the, uh, in the house of the Lord and behold his beauty forever. That's what is being asked of the heart that has not been regenerated. There's a knowledge of and a love for Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 8, having not seen him, you love him, he says, right? You've never seen him, but you love him because he's awesome and he is now dwelling inside of you. You know Christ, okay? That is what, is, is, that is what it is to be Regenerated, And lastly, free will obedience to God. There is a freedom to obey God from the heart so that that is a free will obedience that you desire to do, right? That's why Paul says, Romans 6, 1, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? What's his answer? May never be. Of course not. May it never be. Why? How can we who have died to sin any longer live in it? In other words, I've been united to Christ. I can't keep sinning. Why? Because Christ is in me. If Christ is in me, then I'm going to live for him. If Christ isn't in me, then I need to get saved. Okay? 
Sorry I'm talking so fast. <laughs> Does all this make sense? Stop me at any point. Raise your hand. Okay, good. Now, last one, number three. It is irresistible. Okay, it is irresistible. This act of regeneration is a gracious work of God. It is this grace that is said to be irresistible. The eye in tulip, right? You can't, you can't say no to the regeneration of God, right? God regenerates. It is, it, is, it is irresistible. God's grace is constantly resisted in other areas. Okay, so when we say there is irresistible grace, we're not saying all of God's grace is irresistible. We're not saying that, right? Because God's grace is constantly resisted by unbelievers, right? Unbelievers resist the grace of God in the external call all the time. <clears throat> However, when God's grace works in the regeneration of the soul, because it comes as a direct work of God, it cannot be resisted, okay? God regenerates. He rebirths someone. It's not something that, that you have any choice in. It was granted to you. You were reborn by the Spirit, okay? The important distinction is that this is not a violation of man's will. Instead, it is a gracious recreation of his nature in such a way that, he, that his will is then freed to obey God rather than disobey. And what does that mean? God makes you new, and in that newness, you choose to believe him. Does that make sense? You're actually like responding in free choice to God. Why? Because he turned the lights on inside of you, right? When he turns the lights on in regeneration, you see him and you say, you're awesome, I want to serve you and love you, and I repent of my sin. Without the lights being turned on, you'll never do that. So the work of God, the act of God, the grace of God that's irresistible is in the new birth, and the response of the soul, the second causality, is to respond to that thing which God has, been, has made known to your mind through the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? God isn't violating human will. God is recreating human nature in such a way that the will is now freed to follow after the thing that it knows. Yeah. Awesome. No, it's okay. We have four minutes. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. We have time. We can go a little bit over, too. It's probably a question other people ask. <laughs> Usually, if you have a question, everyone has the same question. So anyone can feel free to ask any question. Yes? How do you, um, the free will of obedience, how do you tie that with First John 9? It says, everyone who's been born of God does not sin because it's seed of life. He cannot sin. Okay, so, so he's not saying he will never sin, right? That is, those present tense verbs are describing, and that, that whole section, that present tense, those present tense verbs are describing a continuative state. He doesn't remain in a state of unrepentant sin without end, okay? And in fact, that verse would say the exact same thing. The one who is born of God will not continue or perpetuate in his sin forever. Why? Because his seed abides in him. Christ lives inside of him. If he's been rebirthed, he's been born of God, then therefore he will now carry out righteousness and he will turn from his sin and he will repent and walk in, in newness of life because of the power of God that dwells in him through the seed that he's received in the regeneration. Yeah, good question. Okay. <laughs> you can ask, I don't mind. I'm just trying to figure out, so when it says that it doesn't depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy... Yeah. And here you're saying it's a violation of human will, where I feel like God is not violating our will. He's doing what is absolutely necessary, which is a unilateral decision yeah. of you will be saved. Totally. Unilateral mm -hmm. act of regeneration, mm -hmm. and the human will responds to that. Right. So the act of regeneration is not an act of human will. That's what Paul is saying, right? It does not, demand, it does not depend on man who wills or works, but on God who has mercy. But then when you say the relationship of the effectual quality of human will is not unilaterally deterministic. Okay, so the, uh, in the effectual call, yeah? So, so what's happening in that act, right? The effectual call causes regeneration, right? So God is unilaterally working in the effectual call in such a way that there is regeneration. You're born again, new, new heart, right? But we can't say that that's, a, we wouldn't say that that's a violation of the human will, right? There's a simultaneous, in that new birth, there's a simultaneous response of the soul, right? There's a concurrence of the first and second causality. So the soul responds to that, by coming to faith in Christ, by seeing Christ and free will choosing to believe in him. But he's only choosing to believe in him because God has first acted. The first cause is his act in regeneration. No. Yeah. Can you, can you trace that back to creation and say that the people were all created to serve God and then we were blocked by sin? that sin or that original sin has been removed and then we're, you say here that we're free to obey. 
Yeah, yeah, we're, we're made new. I, I, I wouldn't use the language like the original sin is removed. I would say that we're now recreated. Okay. So we are, we are now, we have Adam in us in our birth, right? We have right. his right. sinful nature. Right. And what God does is say, he says, dead, now alive. So yeah, in, in that sense, he, right, Christ is called the second Adam. The second Adam now gives us new life, which is different than the death that we've received from the first Adam. We have a new nature created in us by the second Adam. About the first Adam, it's in our flesh. Yeah, still yep. there. He's in our flesh, right? We got a mouth. Well, yes, we do. Well, <laughs> if, I, if I don't, if, if the new, the last Adam is Christ Himself. Yeah. Then on, do I sin? Oh yes. Where is that? It's got to have a source. Yeah. So Where's Romans. My source. Yeah. So Romans I seven. I still got the first Adam. Yeah, Romans seven twenty two says that that we still have this principle of sin that dwells in us. That we talked about that in anthropology. It still dwells in our flesh. He says it is in the members of our body, right? So the body still has those that those lustful things that occur in our flesh. Our nature is made new in Christ. No. Well, you do, but it's in your flesh. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so the reborn heart sees the glory of Christ, freely chooses Him over sin. The grace of new birth is a sovereign work of God, but the choices that flow from regeneration are a human response to the irresistible glory that the saint now sees. That sentence is super important, right? Irresistible glory, you see the glory of Christ, right? It's not that the grace is irresistible in the sense that God is violating your will. It's irresistible in the fact that God made you alive, and now you can't resist him, not because you want to resist him, but because he's irresistible. God is beautiful, right? And you see his glory, and you're like, that's what I want. I want him, and you move toward him in faith, repentance and obedience okay that's in that sense it is it is irresistible okay point d it is a divine mystery the bible does not provide us with a specific description of what happens in the act of regeneration what happens when you're born again i have no idea it doesn't say anywhere there's no text that would tell us exactly what's taking place in the human soul it just says we're given new life we're made new we're recreated all that's the language and we don't understand how that happens any more than we understand what happened when god created the light that exists in the universe between here and alpha centauri i have no idea how he did that i have no idea what that looked like all we know is he said it and then it was there right i don't know how that happens so so the specifics of the how aren't important but the why and the what is important okay god's divine and sovereign action in regenerating the sinner is seen but not understood that's why Christ uses the example of the wind. You, you can see the results of the wind, but you don't understand the wind itself. Divine life is imparted to the dead heart, and the means and efficacy of that reality is a mystery beyond the scope of our understanding in a way similar to the means of God's creation of light. Okay? And last one, point E, it must precede faith. Regeneration must precede faith. It should be clear that this regenerating work of God must come before true faith can occur in the heart. Why? You don't see Christ. You can't believe in something you don't see. If you don't see him because your heart is dead, you can't believe in him, right? But when God makes your heart alive and you see him, then what happens? The, the, the immediate response of that is what? I believe in Jesus. Not because you've made some rational cognitive choice to believe in Jesus, but because the reality of knowing Christ in your heart has made you believe in him, right? You're reborn, what happens? You believe instantaneously in Christ. There's nothing else that you could possibly do because you're standing in his presence in a spiritual sense truly, right? Hebrews chapter 12. Good. And apart from this work of God, faith is impossible because faith is a mental apprehension and acceptance of the things of the Spirit of God. This is entirely impossible apart from the work of God in regeneration. Okay? And then we have some, uh, some oh, that was, that's wrong, uh, applications of the effectual call. Three things there, okay? One, prayer and praise for salvation of unbelievers. <clears throat> what do you do? What's the most important thing in sharing the gospel? Making sure it's clear, making sure you have all the details. No. Prayer. Prayer. Pray for them. Why? Because this is entirely a work of God, right? Spurgeon said, if you argue with a man for one hour, pray for him for ten. That's, that's a good rule of thumb, right? I, I, if you discuss this gospel and you share the gospel, when you get in your car, pray for the salvation of their soul. Pray that God would take those truths and make it alive to them. Make them alive to it. Okay? <laughs> Second. Uh, and obviously, we praise God for the salvation of unbelievers. If you do share the gospel and someone gets saved, what do you do? <sighs> it's because I'm so godly. I'm amazing. I'm such a good preacher or teacher. No. God did this remarkable sovereign work. I was trying to do something impossible. God intervened and did it. That's remarkable. We praise God for that, not ourselves, right? Second, confidence in God's power for our and others' sanctification. If a person is born again, what will happen? God will sanctify them, right? He will eventually, and some people's growth track is like this, 
Like, I think that's horizontal. They're like, no, it's like, <laughs> it's right there, <laughs> right? It might be super slow, and that's okay. God is doing that work at the pace that he wants to sanctify, and he will do that work in the heart that's truly regenerated. So we just wait and pray and ask and work with him for the sake of the, uh, for the, sake of the sanctification of others. Okay, and then last but not least, we have a knowledge of infinite power for change. The God who created the universe dwells inside of you. That's craziness. If he created the sun, he can help you fight sin, right? And he lives inside of you in such a way that his life is your life. You have the power to change, okay? Let me pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for your word and how it informs us and instructs us. Lord, I know this is a lot to cover in one day, but Lord, just pray that you would help us. Lord, help us to think through these realities. Lord, to worship you because of what you've done in us. And Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, that it is a work of your divine and sovereign grace that we would ever come to know you. So, Lord, we just bless you. We thank you. We praise you for what you've done in us. Lord, we pray for those around us. Lord, even as we think of the outreach meeting today, Lord, we pray that the gospel would go forth from our church and then many would be saved because of it. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Christ. In his most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.